Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Daniel LaRoche, and today I'm going to talk to you about conquering glaucoma, uh, both preventing glaucoma and preventing blindness with early cataract surgery, clear lensectomy, trabecular bypass, and a new suprachoroidal surgery. I've been doing glaucoma surgery for the last 25 years. I have a private practice in New York and Manhattan, Uptown Harlem, and Southeast Queens. I'm affiliated with New York Eye and Infirmary at Mount Sinai, Icon School of Medicine, where I do most of my surgery also at NYU and at Island Eye out in Long Island. And I wanna to talk to you and share some pearls with you that's gonna really help you uh, manage glaucoma and conquer glaucoma in your patients. My approach to glaucoma is really with a new surgical algorithm. You know, most people approach glaucoma with medications first, laser, and surgical therapy. In my opinion, the cataract or the large lens is the most identifiable cause of glaucoma in most of my patients. When I was first training back in 1994-96, we learned to treat glaucoma with medications, laser and trabeculectomy, but there was no discussion about the cataract. Now, my approach is trying to offer earlier surgery with cataract extraction and trabecular bypass first. There are some exceptions like neovascular glaucoma and congenital glaucoma that will use traditional surgery like a tube implant or goniotomy. Then go to medications or laser, and then a new suprachoroidal surgery that I'll talk to you about today. And then uh, if needed, trabeculectomy and subconjunctival tube shunt surgery. But I've not done trabeculectomy in the last couple of years with these above techniques. I'm going to go through that with you. The Baltimore Eye Survey showed that the mean normal intraocular pressure is 15 in the absence. The mean intraocular pressure in patients with untreated glaucoma is 18. And that's very important. But you'll see here that people with a pressure of 15, the chances of having any visual field or developing glaucoma is really minimal generally speaking, even if you have a small corneal hysteresis. Um, now, when you get to the 15 range or higher, this is what you sort of need to be worried about above here. Uh, with the thinner corneas, you'll get more progression of the visual field compared to thicker corneas or higher corneal hysteresis. We know elevated intraocular pressure leads to both mechanical and vascular damage of the optic nerve pair. Here you have excavation that takes place. You can get disc hemorrhage, nurse loss of nerve fiber layer. And this triggers an autoimmune cascade with this elevated pressure, leading to the death of retinal ganglion cells. And here you see elevated intraocular pressure, uh, triggering an autoimmune cascade that can lead to retinal ganglion cell death. And here you have loss of retinal ganglion cells. This elevated IOP leads to increased CD4 cells, T cells, that take place. And these T cells attack the retinal ganglion cells, leading to loss of visual field. So it's very important to preserve uh, the integrity of the retinal ganglion cell by keeping the intraocular pressure normal. Uh, keeping the intraocular pressure low it enhances perfusion pressure, reduces mechanical stress, and prevents the autoimmune cascade from taking place. So why do people still go blind from glaucoma if we know all of these things? Well, in my opinion, glaucoma is really not properly being treated. We know that with medications, you have a high amount of noncompliance from 50% with one medication, 61% for two, 70 percent for multiple medications. And this is a nice study, a Morse field eye study back in 1994 that showed that primary surgery with trabeculectomy resulted in the lowest mean intraocular pressures, okay, and the most stable visual fields over medications and surgery. Here's surgery. Let me just move this out the way. I'll put this down here. Here's surgery. Here's medicines. Here's laser in terms of success of surgery. Surgery did much better in lowering the intraocular pressure. Uh, here, surgery did much better in terms of preservation of visual field compared to medicines and laser. A uh, SIGIT study showed that surgery did better than medications in mild and more severe glaucoma, particularly in terms of preserving visual field. Our uh, most recent study, primary two versus trabeculectomy study, after three years, uh, trabeculectomy did better in terms of lowering the intraocular pressure compared to tube shunts. But you, the problem with this type of surgery is you get loss of vision that can occur. Um, you know, two lines of vision can be lost in about 15% of patients in both groups. Uh, it requires a high number of post-operative interventions, and over 50% need some sort of post-operative intervention to stabilize the eye. Um, you can get some serious complications in a small percentage of patients here. But the big thing also is that you get about 30% in both groups get cataract progression within three years. So when you do this type of traditional glaucoma surgery, you're going to, you know, worsen the cataract. Uh, and you're going to need additional surgery after that. Once again, the main cause of glaucoma over 50, in my opinion, is the cataract, and I'm going to show you how that, is, how that happens. With age, the lens in the eye 
the thickness increases. From age 20, it's about 3.6 millimeters, and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker until over age 50 and 60, okay? The diameter of the lens remains the same, okay? But see, the thickness increases with age. And we know also, recently, there are some genetic components of glaucoma. We get uh, APBB2 locus. That's like a protein misfolding gene that could lead to the buildup of amyloid that could be neurotoxic. But these beta amyloid plaques can also contribute to cataract formation and maybe earlier cataract formation. And you can see here you have abnormal crystalline lens proteins, formation of vacuoles that could probably lead to thickening of the lens and cataract formation in these patients. And we can see here the lens size increases with age, as we spoke about. Uh, with age, you have an increased percentage of cataracts that increases. Once again, here over age 50, number of cataracts increase with time. And what else happens over age 50? The prevalence of glaucoma increases. Whether you're in Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, it increases over age 50 as you get older. And all ethnic groups from age 40, 50, 60, 70, over age 50, it continues to get higher as well. It has the highest prevalence in blacks. And in part, that's due to decreased access to cataract surgery, both in Africa and the Caribbean nations like Haiti, and in many uh, uh, black areas in the United States where they have decreased access to cataract surgery. This is a map that shows a number of ophthalmologists worldwide. And you can see that Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Afro-Caribbean areas have the fewest and Cuba uh, and Greece and Europe have the highest ophthalmologist numbers there. And once again, with Medicare data, blacks have about 30% less cataract surgery than whites that occur. This is a wide variation of access to ophthalmologists for the United States on the East Coast and on the West Coast, you have the highest density of ophthalmologists, less, less so in the Midwest. And in terms of severe vision loss, the Midwest and the South has the highest amount of vision loss compared to the East Coast and the West Coast. Now, shifting gears to the uh, Schlems Canal and the trabecular meshwork, this is a review of the anatomy. You have the uveal meshwork, corneal scleral meshwork, just the canalicular meshwork and Schlems Canal and the collected channels over here. Now, Schlem's canal decreases in size with age. You see here, um, the size decreases from age 8 years old, 34 years old, 48 years old, 75 years old. So with age, um, the Schlem's canal decreases with age. Now, this is a video that shows you the mechanism of glaucoma. The cause of blindness globally affecting nearly 80 million people by 2020. This silent thief of sight involves optic nerve damage and visual field loss secondary to retinal ganglion cell damage or cell death. The eye produces fluid from the ciliary processes to bathe the eye. The fluid drains via the trabecular meshwork, aqueous veins, uveoscleral pathway, and suprachoroidal space. With time, the trabecular meshwork ages and the lens of the eye becomes larger, developing a cataract. This narrows the drainage angle, reducing the ability of aqueous to drain from the eye. Additionally, in some patients, the zonules that attach the lens to the iris rub against the posterior iris, releasing pigment that further blocks the outflow pathway. This, in addition to genetic predisposition in some patients, leads to elevated intraocular pressure. This increased pressure goes on to damage the optic nerve, described as cupping. When this occurs, medical therapy should be initiated. Since as many as 50% of patients fail medical eye drop therapy, early cataract extraction can be performed to open the angle, and goniotomy should be performed to remove the damaged trabecular meshwork to help improve aqueous flow. Patients with advanced glaucoma due to worsening outflow will need an additional intervention. Now, here, these are the zonules that I'm talking about in the lens here, okay? And this rubs up against the posterior iris, and I'll show you how. These are normal zonules, excuse me. These are normal zonules. These are long anterior zonules here. And as the lens gets larger in width, it rubs up against the iris, okay? And this leads to iris, irritable lenticular contact that leads to pigment liberation. And you can see sometimes the pigment on lens zonules here in the eye. You can see it over here. Um, and this is a video that shows what happens during accommodation. The lens gets thicker during accommodation. And look at this, you get posterior bowing of the lens that occurs during accommodation as well, that increases irritable lenticular contact that releases pigment that further goes on to block off the drainage angle. 
And you can see this pigment blocking off the trabecular meshwork. So it's very important to do gonioscopy. If anyone has a pressure of 18 or higher, I automatically look for this pigment deposition inside the angle. Very, very important. Uh, particularly if the pigment's uh, denser in the inferior angle compared to the superior angle. That indicates pigment liberation taking place. You can see her pigment over here as well. Uh, this is a video from Murray Johnston that shows Schlem's canal, the trabecular meshwork here. And you'll see the dynamic activity that occurs with the cardiac cycle to help pump up aqueous. And this is a great video that Marie's done. You can see how that works here, okay? Now in mild glaucoma, you can see here decreased ability of Schlem's canal, thickening of the trabecular meshwork, pigment obstruction and thickening. And in more advanced glaucoma, you get the same thing over here, significant thickening of the TM and a reduction in Schlem's canal outflow. Now, in someone with glaucoma, if you do trabeculectomy first, okay, it will fail because of this lens iris pigment liberation activity going on, releasing the pigment, the pigment will release and block off the trabeculectomy site, okay? So that's why I've stopped doing that. I like to take the cataract out first. Now, what if you do a Zen? If you do a Zen, you'll get the same thing. Uh, here is a Zen. If you have subconjunctival obstruction, you can remove the subconjunctival obstruction. We reported where you could attach a barbell uh, in these patients uh, to help save that. But if they have a lens and a lot of pigment there, the pigment can get blocked. And we report in our initial series about 40% failure rate in patients due to intraluminal obstruction of pigment with the Zen. You can see here pigment that gets blocked into the Zen. So I don't like to do Zen first as an initial procedure. I like to make sure the cataract's out first. Now what happens when you take the cataract out? Here is the lens. You take the cataract out. You have opening of the angle. You have elimination of iridal lenticular contact that takes place. And a much more stable eye with a lower pressure. And then what else happens after cataract surgery? You have expansion of Schlem's canal that can go from two to four times to improve the outflow. Okay, we know from many studies that cataract surgery can lower the intraocular pressure from 13 to 71%, depending on the technique. Here's a video, look at this vessel here. I've done cataract surgery alone. I'm putting BSS into the eye and there's complete blanching there, complete enhanced outflow uh, without any glaucoma surgery, just from, from cataract surgery alone. The hydrus data from the horizon study showed from cataract surgery uh, alone, you had excellent lowering of the intraocular pressure. And then when you do it with the hydrus, you get an additional three point drop of lowering of the intraocular pressure alone. And then this is a study from uh, England and Taiwan that shows with increase in phaco emulsification, you could actually reduce the prevalence of angle closure glaucoma. If you can reduce the prevalence with earlier cataract surgery of angle closure glaucoma. This is data from the Eagle study that showed that clear lens extraction showed greater efficacy and was more cost effective than peripheral laser iridotomy in treatment. And I've moved away from doing laser iridotomy and I offer earlier lensectomy in patients with angle closure or occludable angles. When can you perform clear lensectomy? You could do it in angle closure with TM dysfunction with elevated IOP of 30, patients with symptoms of angle closure, uh, systemic medications causing angle closure, patients with angle closure with unreliable access to eye care. And I also currently offer clear lensectomy and trabecular bypass for progression of open angle glaucoma. I'm a little bit earlier on this. Uh, we're looking at the data and I invite you all to look and look at this as a possibility for some of your patients with difficult to control glaucoma. Now cataract surgery is not without risk. You can get supercoral hemorrhage, endophthalmitis, retinal detachment, CME, corneal endothelial loss, elevated IOP, dysphotopsia, incorrect IOL power, refractive error. So it's very important that you're a really good cataract surgeon if you're going to do this as an early treatment for glaucoma because you don't want to get a complication or vitreous loss and make the patient's glaucoma worse. So once again, my approach is uh, medication just until surgery, but I like to do early cataract extraction, len lensectomy with MIGS. Uh, goniotomy, hydrus, omni, cahook, 23-gauge cystitone. Then I'll talk about supercoral surgery uh, soon as well. And I really not have to do much trabeculectomy or subconjunctival tube shunts with this combination of these procedures here. I'm going to shift gears to talk about the hydrus stent. This is one of my favorite procedures to use. It's made out of ninetal, uh, contoured to match the canal curvature, has three open windows, faces the anterior chamber. Um, you can see here, uh, this is a trimodal mechanism of action. Uh, we have trabecular bypass, you have scaffolding of Schlem's canal, and you have a, a 90 degree span across Schlem's canal. Uh, the data in terms of lowering intraocular pressure going compared to cataract surgery is better than the compass study, which was with Cypass and the ice stent inject. 
I don't like the ice that inject too much because it's too small. And oftentimes, half the time, you're not in Schlem's Canal. You can be in the trabecular meshwork, but you don't get into Schlem's Canal over here. This is data from Andre Mahmoud showing sometimes you can overshoot Schlem's Canal as well. Another ice that inject that overshoots Schlem Canal. So half the time, you don't really know where you're at beyond the trabeculum. In my patients, I've seen it get stuck in the trabeculum where it would not even be able to penetrate those thickened TMs because it's just too small. Uh, once again, we've talked about laser. It's not really as effective longer term. Uh, this was a study uh, comparing the hydrous microstent to SLT by uh, Anthony Fia out of Italy. And he showed after 12 months, there was significant decrease in IOP with me and medications with both groups, but there was a threefold greater reduction in medication use in the hydrous group compared to the SLT group. So that did much better. Now, when you're going to do these mixed procedures I'm going to talk about, you have to have a microscope that tilts. The patient's head has to tilt. We have a direct gonial lens here. Uh, so you have to get used to that positioning. So when you've done cataract surgery, you want to try to position the head, maybe take a look at the angle with the gonial lens and get used to that initially. And when one of the reps works with you, depending on which technique you use, um, you know, that will help you uh, as well to learn. This is a video as a patient with clear lens over here. You can see the zonules over here. I'm going to do lensectomy and hydrostent. Uh, here's the IOL we've placed in. You see the heavily pigmented trabecular meshwork. I'm going to bypass with the hydrous inserter here. And once I get through there, I'm going to dial the hydrostent into Schlem's canal. I'm about 15 degrees here. And now I'm dialing it into Schlem's canal behind the obstructive pigmented trabecular meshwork. So I just bypass that. I scaffold to the TM and I'm using the inserter to just push it in a little bit more. I like to tuck it in a little bit more sometimes into the canal. And here, you're gonna see these vessels blanch. I'm putting BSS into the eye here. And you're going to see restoration of aqueous outflow through the aqueous veins over here. Um, you can use tripan blue. Okay, report this done, was done with the cahook blade, the tripan blue. And here you can see tripan blue, um, several hours of collected channels that are blue uh, with the stent. And here's a UBM that shows uh, restoration of stem canal anatomy. Okay, and you see the reflection from the hydrostent on the UBM, elimination of lens iris contact to improve aqueous outflow. Um, here's another hydrous case also. I'm gonna show you this vessel that's gonna blanch and I'm going to put, uh, insert the hydrous here, I have viscoelastic, I have my direct corneal lens, this is a catena lens that costs about $25, disposable lens. And I'm bypassing this pigmented trabecular meshwork here and insert the hydrostent into Schlem's canal here. And here's, I left it out a little bit long, so I'll take a Sinsky hook and bring it in and push the hydrus against the back wall of Schlem's canal and insert it into the eye. And I tuck that in a little bit more there. And I'll use BSS, look at this vessel over here. As I inject BSS into the eye, you'll see restoration of outflow through the aqueous veins. Okay, with this, I rarely have to do trabeculectomy. Uh, Hydra's four-year data shows that 65% of patients are medication-free compared to cataract surgery alone, only 41% are medication-free. Um, this is a four-year Captain Meyer curve in terms of needing additional surgery. On 2% of the hydrous patients needed additional surgery compared to 6% of the cataract surgery patients. So who can you pick? Well, patient selection, patients over 50 with glaucoma, IOP 18 and higher or greater are, are good candidates. Even if the patient's 20-20, usually a lot of these people over 50 have glare of some sort, uh, presbyopia. You could do refractive lensectomy in a hydrous if needed to, to control their glaucoma. And this helps to eliminate or reduce some medication use and preserve the distal collective channels and aqueous veins. In my series, so far I've done uh, 75 patients with six months follow-up. I've done over 200 cases with hydrus. And you can see here, people with advanced glaucoma that had patients that were on 3.1 medications uh, pre-op at six months, uh, they were only on 1.1 medication to be about 15 or less. 
Uh, people with mild glaucoma that were on 2.3 medications at six months was 0.44. 74% of our patients were medication free at six months. Uh, sometimes people don't want to leave a device in the eye. Uh, another device you can use to do trabecular bypass is the Omni gonio system. And this has a catheter that can rotate out about 180 degrees when you go around Schlem's canal. And when you retract it back, it leaves a bolus of viscoelastic in Schlem's canal. And what I'll do with this is usually do a 180 degree inferior goniotomy here. And I'll show you similar to the hydrus, you have this inserted device, you have to bypass the trabecular meshwork. Uh, you see the pigmentation block in the meshwork here. And I'm just making a decision here uh, at this angle. And I'm gonna insert the catheter into uh, Schlem's canal, and you see I'm rolling it out and dialing it out into Schlem's canal 180 degrees, uh, breaking up some septa. Sometimes you can just retract the catheter back and preserve Schlem's canal. In this case, I'm opening up and creating a, a goniotomy here. And so I'm just gently pulling it out as I'm retracting back the catheter. And you see blood reflux here. Okay, I'm just putting some viscoelastic here just so you can see that nice goniotomy here. Okay, right where Schlem's canal is over here. Then you see these aqueous veins over here. I'm gonna put BSS in over here and you'll see blanching all throughout here. Okay, so you have a nice outflow there. And then here I'm gonna show you with tripan blue, um, you'll see these aqueous veins light up blue, blue, and there's some blue over here as well. So it's pretty widespread and diffuse, even over here where I didn't even treat this aqueous outflow there as well. And so uh, studies on this by Steve Sarkazian showed excellent uh, reduction in number of medications with this, excellent lowering of the intraocular pressure with this as well. Um, now, sometimes, Internationally, if you're doing medical missions, you can't use these expensive devices to do a goniotomy. You can use a 23-gauge cystotome. We reported this technique uh, using a 23-gauge cystotome. Eagle Labs makes a pre-bent 23-gauge cystotome here that's 25 millimeters. And this, you'll see here, a goniotomy with a 23-gauge cystotome here. I'm opening up the drain again. This costs $4. And here's a I'm bypassing the pigmented trabecular meshwork. And creating a goniotomy cleft here. And then I'm gonna use a Sinsky hook. Uh, Dr. Tenito has some trabecular hooks that he uses, but you could use a Sinsky hook um, and I'm opening up the other half with the Sinsky hook. This is the patient that had a previous failed trabeculectomy. You can see the iridectomy here to open that up and create a nice goniotomy cleft right there. Okay. So if you're doing, uh, I teach this abroad internationally, and you can see here, um, you've taken the cataract out. You had the iris lens rubbing over here. You had a pupillary block configuration here. We removed the lens. So there's no longer any lens iris rubbing. And you, here you had a, compressed, obstructed Schlem's canal that's been opened up with the goniotomy here. We taught this technique in Ethiopia with Dr. Biba Georges at the Menelik Eye Hospital, uh, Dr. Jonathan Pons in Swaziland, who was used to using Kahook blades, but he would always run out because, you know, the Kahook could be very expensive, about $450, and he's been using cystotomes, and it works like a charm for him, as he says. Now I'm going to shift gears to suprachoroidal surgery. The side pass was taken off the market because of corneal edema. The eye stent supra is not available yet. The gold shunt is not at market, um, nor the aqua shunt. And this is the mini inject that's currently under study in Europe right now. And this is a technique I want to share with you, a suprachoroidal technique where I use a tube extender to do an ab external suprachoroidal behind the iris to the suprachoroidal space uh, to enhance suprachoroidal outflow. Now, why suprachoroidal outflow? Well, the pressure differential between the anterior chamber and the suprachoroidal space is about four millimeters. You have a continuous absorptive reservoir, single point access to the suprachoroidal continuum with up to 160 times more surface area. And we know that prostaglandins 
is the best first line therapy uh, and it acts at the uveal scleral pathway. Now in our initial series uh, of patients, uh, the average pressure reduction was 36% at three months, and the amount of glaucoma medications for patients at three months dropped from three to 20 to 0 0.25, excuse me. And you can see here, I use a tube extender here. Um, you can use internationally outside the United States, less expensive Crawford canalicular tubing, a box of three is about $180, it's about similar size. Uh, outside the United States, you can use silicone tubing from Hurricane Medical, it's about $10 for the sterile silicone tubing. And on our initial series of 26 patients, 18 were successful with moderate to advanced glaucoma. The mean pre-op IOP was 21 or 4.2 medications. The mean post-op IOP was 12. You can get low travel-like pressures, but you will still need medications when you're doing this alone. There's 2.4 medications here. The risk and benefits are the same as traditional glaucoma surgery, but there's less loss of vision. Uh, complications we encountered were four block tubes that were treated with laser rhodotomy, low intracular pressure. One tube was inserted behind the IOL two patients didn't need a needle revision, and four patients did need additional surgery. These patients do get transit hypotony for the first week. Uh, patients with a thin sclera may require a corneal or scleral patch. It's an inexpensive way to offer your patients access to the suprachoroidal space. You can see here the tube going from ciliary sulcus to the suprachoroidal space. Uh, here, tube in the ciliary sulcus to the suprachoroidal space. You see pooling of aqueous and the ciliary space. This was a patient that had a tube that was blocked by the iris here. I did a laser aerodotomy and that reopened the tube to restore outflow to the tube to the suprachoroidal space. Um, here's a nice cleft that you can see that helps lower the intraocular pressure. You can get a closure of cleft in some of these patients that can lead to like an ocular hypertensive crisis. So you do have to have surveillance on these patients for that. Um, but to reduce the ocular hypertensive crisis, what I also do now is I combine the suprachoroidal technique with a 23-gauge cystotome goniotomy. And so we have six patients so far that are pseudophagic with glaucoma. And these are patients with advanced glaucoma, minus 20 on the visual field, minus 20 dB average on the MD on the visual field. Mean pre-op IOP of 21 on 4.3 medications. At six months post-op, the mean IOP was about 13.5 and 0.83 medications. No serious complications, no bleb, no ocular hypertensive crisis, and the risk and benefits are similar to traditional glaucoma surgery. And I'm gonna show you a video of the technique here. Um, this is a patient that's pseudophagic, and here I'm doing the goniotomy portion first with his glaucoma, and I'm using a 23-gauge cystotome and a Sinsky hook. I'm gonna do the goniotomy first in a traditional manner with viscoelastic in the eye, and a Katina Bonio lens. And here is a Sinsky hook that I used to open up and create a nice goniotomy cleft. And I closed the wound up with a 10 nylon suture here. And I perform an infrotemporal conjunctival pyridomy. So this is Clap Forceps Westcott scissors and I'll give a little supplemental block with uh, lidocaine and marcaine for the suprachoroidal portion of the procedure. You could use intracameral lidocaine for the goniotomy portion. This is the adovical suture. I'm gonna pass through the inferior corner just to retract the globe upward. I like to do this procedure inferiorly. I like to preserve the superior uh, conjunctiva for potential future MIGs like Zen or Preserflow. Here with 0.12 forceps and a crescent blade, I do about a four millimeter by six millimeter scleral flap. It's gonna be a 50% thickness scleral flap. And this is, a, and this is a paracentesis I'm making superiorly. I'm gonna place viscoelastic uh, behind the iris. I'm just breaking up some adhesions between the iris and the lens here. And you can use, a, heel on, end of coat, and I'm creating a space in the salary sulcus behind the iris in front of the lens. This is a tube extender, I'm cutting it. I create a bevel, I'm gonna put the bevel facing the intraocular lens. This is a 23 gauge needle, I'm making an incision behind, two millimeters from the limbus, I'm gonna go in behind the iris into the salary sulcus. You see my needle come out there, and I widen it as I come out. I place the tube extender into position into the ciliary sulcus. 
and I pull it out of the visual axis. So you'll be able to see it behind the iris when dilated. And I use a 10-0 proline suture through the tube to the sclera to anchor it so it doesn't move. Okay. And what's nice about this procedure is you don't get a bleb. You get pretty good visual recovery. And the post-operative care is pretty easy. You do get transit hypotony uh, initially. Uh, that the patients always come back up over time. This is 0.12, and the crescent blade, I make an incision through the sclera to the suprachoroidal space, which is a real space, about 30 microns, beneath the sclera here, and you see the choroid there, and I cut the tube a couple of minutes beyond the incision, and I cut it flush, and with 2.12 forceps, I grab the sclera, and I just tuck the tube into the suprachoroidal space, and I close the sclera flat, and I use two 80 vicral sutures to close the sclera and uh, running locking 80 vicral sutures to close the conjunctiva, similar to like a tube shunt closing. And so this is the ab external procedure for the supercoral space. You don't have to worry about corneal edema because the tube is never in front of the anterior chamber. I think any anterior chamber tube is at risk of doing a corneal cause and causing a corneal edema. Here the tube is behind the iris, far away from the cornea. These patients are not gonna have to worry about corneal edema. Here's a tube uh, beneath the sclera. This patient had osteogenesis imperfecta within sclera, so I added a corneal patch, but you don't need that in a regular patient. We've taught this technique uh, with Dr. Gunrose group, uh, group in Nigeria, uh, in Haiti with Dr. Mike Mangret, Dr. Pierre de Castro. These are affordable microinvasive glaucoma procedures uh, and with cataract extraction that can really bend the curve of blindness with glaucoma. So in conclusion, cataract surgery, trabecular bypass, ciliary sulcus supercoral microsurgery can be performed early in glaucoma. It can help prevent glaucoma, decrease rates of blindness from glaucoma, avoid the complications of subconjunctival filtering surgery. Further research is definitely required. Um, if you made it this far in the presentation, I wanna say thank you. Um, if you have any questions or comments or even criticism, you can email them to me please directly. Um, I like to learn and try to improve my game. Um, if you want more information, that's my website there. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, be safe. And uh, I hope I shared some pearls to help you. Thank you.